everyone, welcome back to another special episode of DeLorean Tech. In the world of automotive legends, few names resonate with the same timeless fascination as DeLorean. Synonymous with innovation, style, and a touch of Hollywood flair, the DeLorean has left an enduring mark on automotive history. Today we have the privilege of sitting down once again with Mr. Zach DeLorean, the son of the legendary John Z, for a second official interview at DCS. As we delve into the conversation, Zach opens up about his bond with the DeLorean community, sharing insights into his experiences over the past two years since his last interview. From engaging with enthusiasts to exploring new possibilities, his journey offers a unique perspective on the ongoing legacy of the DeLorean name. Join us as Zach shares his thoughts on the developments shaping the future of the DeLorean motor car. He also opens up about his relationship with his father, offering a glimpse into the personal side of the automotive icon. Stay tuned as we explore the past, present, and future through the eyes of Zach DeLorean. Hello, everybody. Hi. How is everybody today? Good. Well, for those of you who don't know me, everybody knows Zach DeLorean. Um, I'm Tom Cedar. I've been a DeLorean owner since 1992. Um, I've loved that car. I've worked in that car, and man, I just love wrenching on it. Um, and I feel very privileged today to be here with Zach DeLorean. Zach and I had an opportunity to uh, drive in from Cincinnati yesterday. And man, can this guy tell a story. So he makes a Q&A real easy. But having been a member of the DeLorean Midwest Connection now for 25 years, um, I've known Rich throughout that whole time. There have been a lot of members, some have passed recently in the past couple of years, but um, Mr. Swan over there is one of the other members for a long time. And all the really new members, the gentlemen sitting up in that front row are really good friends of ours. So one of the things that's crazy about what your dad did is something that you probably didn't even realize. Your dad did some things technically that just blew us all away. Um, and the thing about it is, we're sitting here in a, in a room full of people that would have never have been together. And it's one thing to build a car company, it's one thing to do things technically, but when you can get camaraderie with people, and we saw that with you last time at DCS. And the thing about it that really struck me was you're you're a really down to earth guy. Um, you're very to the point. You're like my wife tells me exactly what's what should be, and uh, not about my wife, but point is is that you're really straight. You know, you call it like it is, and I I think a lot of people. I know a lot of people respect that. And the fact that you can tell a story better than most people in this room is uh, is another another step up. But so two years ago, how many people here were here two years ago? for Framing John DeLorean. And those who haven't, have you seen Framing John DeLorean? Tamir did an unbelievable job. And at the end of last year, DCS, a lot of people said about you being the star of that, and I completely agree. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, I'm just telling you how I feel. Um, excuse me, Jack, I spoke French. I speak French a lot, I know you do too. Um, <laughs> but, so one of the things that was really cool is that, that Zach had mentioned, um, when the whole thing started. I know you guys want to hear him talk, but I just got to say a couple things. One of the things that was really cool about um, that whole experience is, and there's a lot of stories you told, but there's one that was really cool, because I'm really close to my mom. Um, I'm a mama's boy. And I have a lot of respect for people, especially people in my family. One thing that was said was really cool is uh, you said, yeah, I called my mom before I came up here to Chicago. You didn't know what to expect. And uh, you said, your mom said, just make sure that you wear a real nice pair of slacks and a real nice shirt. <laughs> you know, it's okay if you're like 15, 20, but you know, you're like 50, and so am I. And so I thought that was, it, what, it thought, what struck me about that was that, you know, it's a sense of respect for other people. And when you meet people, you know, honestly, a lot of us didn't know what to think of what you were gonna be like. And, to see the way you are, as humble as you are, you know, salt of the earth kind of guy, guy you could pull up at a bar, have a beer with, and just have a good old time, doesn't care. He, he won't even tell you, who, he doesn't even tell you what his name is if you ever meet him. I've, I've seen him around, he doesn't say anything, just blends right in. And that kind of character is the kind of character a lot of us in this room are like. And so we feel, and somebody has said this before, and I think you did, Anthony, that, you know, last year or two years ago, 
that you know we feel like you're part of our family and I don't have a big family I have no sisters I have no brothers I only have my mom everybody else is in Slovakia I don't have a big family so a lot of these people in this room are part of that and you know so I'm just really 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 happy that you're here I'm just ecstatic that I had five hours to talk to you in the car yesterday and um, I'm gonna shut up but the thing is, is that people saw what you're like, and I think they want to know more about you. I think people want to know what makes you tick. I got a sense of it, and I really liked it. I want them to experience that, too. So, short of that, um, thank you for being here. Thanks for coming out. Um, and people want to just hear that TikTok. What makes, what makes this guy tick? Tell us stories about your dad, your mom, your sister, everything's changed. So I'll, just, I'll ask this one simple question, and then... Let you take over. So, what's happened in your life since the last time we saw you in 2021 DCS here? And when we talk in the car, it's not a simple answer, but I love it. Well, thanks for having me up, and thank you for inviting me. It's uh, <laughs> happy to be back and see a lot of people I had met last or two years ago. Um, and it's uh, you guys are a great group. I really appreciate you extending your hand out and, and having me come back again. Um, <clears throat> basically, in the last two years, um, my day-to-day -day life is, is pretty pretty boring. It's uneventful. It's just me and the dog going to work. I sell fucking tacos and beer to whoever. And um, there are, are there any like ten-year-olds in here? Because <laughs> I'm gonna, I've, I've been trying to cut down on the swearing, and it's not really worked out too well this year. So I will be happy to know, Zach, that we had all adults sign up this time. Okay. No, no. <laughs> so, so it is something I'm trying to work on, and society doesn't make it very easy for me to do that. But um, so basically, um, there are a lot of events that. Um, happen about every two to four to six months in the last two years. Um, and I feel like I'm at White Sands National fucking testing ground back in the 1950s as one of those like army dudes in the trench with the glasses and the bomb goes off and it's just, yeah, you're cool, man, you know? Uh, there's no radiation to worry about. Um, I, there's just like a lot of things that have happened down in Texas. Um, apparently I have a long lost brother in England. Um, and uh, I have a family member who lives in New Hampshire who um, is starting a car company. And um, it, it, so when Rich came up here to, or when Rich talked to me and all these events were unfolding, um, I thought it was important for me to come up here and represent um, uh, my father and uh, his legacy and really, really what the DeLorean Motor Company is, not, not what's going on in fucking Texas. And I'm not going to specifically point out anybody. I like the state of Texas. I like most of the citizens in Texas, but it's just one small fucking area in Texas that I'm not too happy about. Um, and so just to kind of quickly put some of this, like to give you my perspective on it, um, I watched just about every presentation today. Um, we had pictures of the actual factory in Ireland. Um, you've actually heard people that worked for the factory, that worked for my father. Um, to me, that's a car company. That is building a car. It is, it is from a cow pasture in Ireland, ground up, production, cars are coming out. Just to keep the numbers round, um, I know there was less than 10,000, but I always say 10,000 cars just to make it easier. Um, to me, that's a production company. 
uh, or a, a manufacturing company, a motor company. So I think I may know the answer to this question when I ask it anyway. So you don't have an NFT token to get in line to buy the next Alpha 5? No. No, I was, somebody sent me a, somebody sent me a, uh, uh, a link to an article on Ty. So somebody had broken into his house and then they took that three-wheeler and the fucking pit, they set it on fire. And in the picture, the only thing that was left was like half the fucking engine block. Dude, that, that totally made my month. Like, so no, I'm not, I'm not interested in buying anybody's perception of the new DeLorean concept. See, my point of, from where I'm sitting, my father was DeLorean Motor Company, right? Like the car. So, you know, he was like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, right? I mean, he's, he's the front man of the whole thing. And for people to think that they can just go out there and do what he did, I think is completely insane. Uh, I just do. I mean, outside, you know, and you'd say what you want about Elon Musk, but I mean, Elon Musk didn't, didn't didn't have the charisma that my father had, but um, he's really like the only other person I know since my dad that went out and, and produced a car. Um, everybody else, like General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, all those guys, those, the guys, the CEOs today were the same CEOs back in 1940, 1950, in my opinion, you know? Um, Stephen Wynn is definitely, does not have Stephen Wayne cannot even sit in the same room with my father when it comes to engineering, marketing, business plans, IQ, and then for him to come out and say that he's continuing the DeLorean legacy. Well, in my opinion, that's bullshit, and a perfect example of that is the separation as, um, as nicely as they parted ways Steven just wants the little six four banger or six banger in the car, okay? When I first, in the documentary, when we were checking out the, the DeLorean at the end of the street, Tamir opened up the, the engine compartment. Man, you could stick two fucking V12s in that thing. And um, I also know for a fact that the as the cars were coming off the line, they were also already having, I don't know if there were blueprints or, or things drawn up for it, but the, my father was already thinking about putting like a, a, a bigger turbocharged engine in the car. And the car hadn't even been in production for two years. So that's the DeLorean legacy. It's not, it's not having this like blinders on it has to be this way, the DeLorean legacy, this is what the car was, this is, and to me that's just kind of bullshit, man. You know, it's, the guy created the GTO for Christ's sake. And you're gonna sit here and tell me that he, he, he wasn't gonna put a bigger engine in it, he wasn't gonna modify stuff? I mean, if that car company had succeeded today, he'd probably have a, a four-door sedan with like twin turbo V12 in it for Christ's sake. I mean, I just, I just had it. The part of me coming up here was to kind of set the record straight to represent my father's legacy, the DeLorean name. And three weeks before I came up here, because I was coming up here, I got yelled at by a family member through text messaging. And the way I read it, it would, yeah, I had to read between the lines, but the way it sounded, the way it was worded, was I felt that the person giving me shit was, a, was questioning my loyalty to my father and my loyalty to the DeLorean family name. I'm the only person that I fucking know of walking around on this planet right now with the DeLorean name tattooed in between my shoulder blades. But yet, I'm not loyal.
I had just, I, I'm sorry, man. I was going to try and be a little bit more peppy. I'm just trying to be a man and stuff the anger down in and just kind of not get sued. So there's just, so that's kind of like the last couple years, every four or six months, these fucking bullshit things keep popping up, man. You know, and then when I come up here and I see you guys in the cars and talking to you, I mean, I talked to, Jesus, man, I must have talked to eight people last night for three hours, you know, and that's what I came up here for, you know, and then you got family members running around, some dude in fucking England and Texas, you know, just creating all kinds of havoc and bullshit that doesn't need to happen. I'm sorry, man, but that's, you know, that's my opinion, you know. Sorry. sorry. Can you hear me? Um, so, number one, um, it's one of those things that for many years we wanted to have here. Your sister had come out to us twice, um, had asked you, she's not here anymore, to be with us to ask, answer questions. So, you are the ambassador for your father. And te technically speaking, everything he did in his life, technically speaking, is amazing. He, is, he was the 70s and 80s of Elon Musk. And that's something to be extremely proud of. Uh, the passion, things that went on, and I mean, everybody's got their perspective on what happened. But really, a lot of times when people get into fights or people go to court, a lot of it's based on what is, what's, what's the driving factor. And there was a, there was a movie called Drive, Drive, Driven. And it's what's that passion is driving. Your dad had that passion. He wanted to keep the company alive. He wanted to keep people gainfully employed. The means with which you do it, questionable, nonetheless. But what's your motivation in life, right? What's your motivation in life? I look over you and I talk to you, and you are so inspired, and you're so, you're so passionate about what you do. And I think, I never met your father, I know Rich did, but I, I think you have a little bit of that, you have that fire in you like your dad did. <clears throat> now, he grew up differently, and unfortunately, he didn't have a big firecracker blow up in his face when he was an you know, early teenager, or a big bomb in this case. And um, I think you've accomplished a lot. We're so, we are so thankful you're, you're here to share the stories you're going to continue on. One of the things that I, one of the things I kind of want to touch on is you had brought it up, uh, and, the, and it is the DeLorean community. People are sitting right here. Um, what were your? Th I remember you saying something to the effect of, "Man, I thought I was walking in with a bunch of Star Trek nerds, you know, a bunch of guys right around in Doc, Doc Brown outfits and Mc, you know McFly outfits." I had one actually. I feel bad about it now. I do have his underwear on though. Um, Calvin's. Um, anyway, so uh, too much information. Sorry, but what are your th what's your thoughts about us? I mean, you know, one of the things you talk about. We talked about wrenching cars, right? Now. People with carburetors obviously maybe wrench more in their cars different than others. That guy had pretty much just took apart his entire engine in the past uh, three months. We wrench our cars, whether it's because whether it's because um, the car we want more performance enhancements or subtleties over car work forty years you have problems with. But you seem to like that the fact that we were wrenchers. And one of the things about you is that you were a wrencher too. When you uh, when you were a kid, you kind of started off with motocross. You said about your dad that um, you started writing 50s, Honda 50s with your dad, right? And um, did your dad ever like step you through how to fix a motorcycle, how to no. fix a car? He never did? No. No, I, I didn't learn shit about cars or motorcycles from my father. That's extremely shocking to hear. Yeah, yeah everything I've learned, I've had a um, basically huh. go to Auto zone and buy whatever manual I have sure, for the manual. car I'm fucking driving at the time and read through it and then figure it out. But I mean, we, we talk about stuff, but we never, um, we, you know, it's not like I, I'd ever torn down the engine on my motorcycle or anything like that, but like general maintenance and, you know, we, because a lot of my bikes, they always had carburetors, so if the bike sat too long through the winter and there was gas and you had to take it off and clean it and do, you know, all kinds of other stuff, maintenance, just general basic maintenance, how to, 
you know, change your own oil and spark plugs and some other stuff, electrical shit on on anything automotive or motorcycle. I know nothing about. I'll probably make the the make it worse, but um, no, I on Layton, on on the farm in Lamington Farm, my dad um, had uh, bought some woodworking tools like power saws and, and uh, drills, like a drill press and things like that. And he always wanted us to, like on the weekends, his plan was he always wanted us to like have like woodworking projects in this thing. And so I think with his arrest, when he got arrested and then the trial and then the divorce and, 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 uh, and the, all the other trials after that, um, all that stuff kind of kind of went away you know there was there's no more um you know we didn't play ball you know we weren't throwing the ball in the yard you know playing catch or you know the the woodworking projects never came about and uh um you know because then i lived in la for four years he had moved back to new jersey or back to new york so um and then by the time i got back home i was already you know i was 16 so you know, the idea of me spending a Saturday night in a, building a fucking birdhouse with my father really didn't sound too appealing. You know, I was out chasing girls and getting high and drinking beer. So, um, so like a lot of that stuff never, um, I, I feel like if none of that had, if, if, the, if the bust and the trial didn't happen, um, I, think, I think it would have, I think, we would have done more father and son projects that way, but I think just because of the chaos surrounding all that stuff, um, you know, it just never, it just never happened. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't begrudge my father because of it, you know, because we didn't do woodworking projects or because he never taught me how to take the engine out of a car and re, you know, rebuild it. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I've, I've lost anything out of my life because of that, you know, and I, I certainly don't hate my father because of it, you know, it's, I think it's just the opposite, you know, I love my father very much and, and I miss him, you know, not as much as when he died, but, you know, I mean, I still do miss him. And, uh, you know, so like, Man, I don't really know where the hell I'm going with all that. So, but one of the things, tell him, no, no, say no, my no. dad's dead and I don't love him. I mean, that doesn't sound good. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's just you know, I never, we never really did those kinds of projects together. We we just didn't. Yeah. Time didn't do. Yeah. It wasn't affordable. But you guys, you guys rode motocross. Did he ride motocross too, or you just? He didn't. He um, no. I mean, we would uh, like. So when I first started riding, I learned to ride when he had his ranch out in Palm Valley, California, and that's where we would go for like Christmas break or uh, my spring break. And um, so we'd ride around on, the, on his ranch together and things like that. Um, and then he bought Lamington Farm, I think in 1980. And uh, so we would occasionally ride the property together on, on our motorcycles. Um, and then, uh, and then I made friends out in, in uh, New Jersey. So then I was riding more with my friends than my dad. But every once in a while, he he he'd want to take the bike out with me and go ride out in the field and things like that. Um, but he used to drive me to a couple motocross tracks local. Um, and then when we were when I was living with him in California after the trial, uh, he took me to uh, a couple motocross tracks out there. And then um, there's a place called Hungry Valley. It's just like just big open space. There's no no motocross track, but we go up there and ride and stuff like that. So you maybe didn't uh, actually take a part of car, but you did go with your dad to the plant. Yeah. You spent a day, or was it two? It was like one or, one or two days. Yeah, you were like what, twelve or eleven? Or what was that? Nineteen eighty. The, the press conference thing. 81. 81. Yes, sir. So I was nine because I was turning, I turned 10 that October. Right. So. so you did see the car actually put together. What, what did you, did you have any, I, it's probably hard to say, but do you have any recollection of that trip? Uh, was it more with the plant? Was it the time you spent with your dad on the plane, which was a Concord, by the way? So there's, I got a couple good stories about that. Um, Where's the gentleman? Is it Barry? 
Yeah, you you were talking about the airport. Yeah. I got a good story. I'm gonna just tell a couple things, but I got a good one when we were leaving. Um, I'm nine years old, and so I basically remember the trip as more of as a father and son trip. I didn't realize like the whole fucking press crew was sitting in the back of the Concord with us, you know. And it, in truth be told, like. With speed is relative. If you're 30,000 feet in the air and you're doing a thousand miles an hour, you don't even know it because there's nothing, there's no trees, there's no other car, so you don't really, you don't really have a gauge to exactly how fast you're going. So, and it's gonna sound fucked up, but it, it just kind of felt like you were on any other plane, you know, because you, there's no. You know, the thing flies so damn high up in the air anyway. I mean, it, it flies, I think it flew higher than what most commercial 747s fly at, but it flew at like Mach 3, or Mach 1.3. So when we, when we were, I think it was either we were going to London or we were coming back to New York, whichever way it was, that Concorde actually set the record for the fastest flight for a Concorde. And it was like, I, I, I don't, I don't I'm, not, I'm not even gonna say the hours because I, I don't wanna fuck that up. But, um, and so that whole trip, I just really kind of felt like it was more of a father-son trip because we stayed in London and then we had to fly over to Ireland. Um, and I think when my dad was dealing with a lot of the press corps, uh, uh, one of the guys, I, his name is Peter, I don't know his last name, but he, he took me around the factory and I had a little, uh, like a disc camera and I was taking pictures of, you know, just random stuff, I guess, I don't know. And then he took me for a ride around on the test track and things like that and showed me around. Um, and then, uh, and then we went back to, uh, I think it was, and then we flew back to London. It was either that same day or the day after. And then my father, my dad and I, like we went and saw like the changing of the guard at the palace. That was pretty cool. Um, he took me to the Natural History Museum in London. So we did a lot of stuff like that. So that's why I think it felt more like a father-son trip, or at least that's the way I remember it. But the day we were leaving to go back, to the States, <clears throat> we were in the airport and two guys in suits came up to me and took my camera. They took my camera and um, I guess I was like, no. And my dad's like, give it to him. And I guess so I ended up giving it to them. They ended up sending me back the camera in two pictures. And so I think what happened was, um, I think they were like British, like British government guys, whether they were police or the equivalent of the CIA or whoever the fuck these guys were, I don't know. But I, it, it was something like that. And I guess I had asked, you know, it was an accident. I'm just nine years old taking pictures of everything. So I think I got pictures of people that the government, I think they had people work, that working for the government in the plant, like keeping an eye on like the, yeah, cause you had all the IRA shit going on at the time. And so I think I accidentally may have taken pictures of people I wasn't supposed to and I just didn't know it. And so then they, they sent the camera back and then they sent me two pictures. You know, it's uh, your dad um, had a photographic mind from what I read. It was a Detroit Free Press article that said your dad had a photographic mind. He could tell you something. It was in the book. He didn't remember sometimes the page it was on. So that trip in his own mind, he probably did snapshots. And did you guys talk about that later on? Um, no. Do you remember your dad being like that? Do you remember your dad like being able to like recite either like poetry or like plays, movies, books, or like things you did? Like you're a great storyteller. 
Um, and I know you're not your genealogic, your genealogical, you're not your father's son, but you are his son. In some way, did you see him being that great storyteller too, and then he passed that storytelling on to you? Because of his photographic mind? Because you have a hell of a great memory for a lot of things. Um, I, I don't know about the photographic memory part. I mean, I knew my father was obviously smart as hell, smarter than you know most, most people are. I, I don't know what his IQ was. Um, uh, homework could kind of be a pain in the ass because I always felt like if I had a, a, a problem with math or something like that, like instead of like just like helping me like learn short division, it's like I got the fucking like I got the equation on how to build a space shuttle or some shit, you know, and you're like, Jesus, man, I just want to know what two plus two was, you know, but, you know, but he was, um, we would talk a lot, you know, and he would tell me stories of, uh, oh God, you know, a little bit of his family life, um, you know, uh, one day, he told me one story where uh, he was, uh, I forget where he was, but it was it was pitch black at night, and I guess he was on the highway, and, and he was doing, I think, over 100, and uh, uh, I guess he blew by a cop who was parked, and he didn't know it, and so he got far down the road, but he could see the lights, so my dad decided to shut off the fuck, or no, 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 that's what it was. The the um the, then the lights disappeared behind him, so my dad thought he kind of outran him. Well, what ended up happening was is the cop came right up on top of him with no fucking lights on. So my dad pulls over and uh, cop walks up to the car and my dad's like, he's like, did you have your lights off this whole time? And he's the cop's like, yeah. And he's like, Jesus Christ, you know, it's like, you know, like blew my dad's mind and stuff. So those, those are the kind of stories that him and I would talk about. Um, a little bit about his brothers. Um, and uh, we just did a whole lot of talking about, I think about life and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know where I get it from, but, um, because I, I I never really was that way. I think I I think I've gotten I, I think I be, my personality is very different now than it was when I was younger. You know I'm 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 older. I've got nothing to lose. I'm fucked just like everybody else. Um, you know, so it's like you might as well just have fun and 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 have a good time and and have a good time with people. So so uh, I was uh, <clears throat> at Rich's house uh, this past weekend. And it's kind of a somber moment when you called at the right time. Um, and um, you had, we were talking about Rich's mom. Uh, and uh, you had said that you remembered, God bless her soul, by the way. Um, you had mentioned about your dad, that you remembered him when you're sitting in the DeLorean, you remembered him when you'd be sitting at a stop sign, seeing a license plate with JZD or even JZK. Um, you'd, you'd see that and, and it would give you a staunch reminder of your dad being there. Mm -hmm. um, we had brought up to you, Rich and I, that we heard cardinals sit, sitting above us. And uh, you know, if you're spiritual, if you're religious in fashion, you believe things. And uh, you believe that people are always here. You know, our, our hearts are always, their spirits here, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether you're a Christian or not, you don't have to spell any of that, but it seems like you have this connection with your dad that's really cool. And uh, a lot of people can't explain that. Can you explain it? So, I don't know, some of you may know this or may not know this, but I am adopted. So my dad is the only person since I was born, he's the only parent. Like I literally got shot out of the womb and went over to my dad. So um, my dad, my dad has always been extremely important and um, especially later in life, very valuable to me. 
in life. Um, some people have said that um, people who are adopted have abandonment issues. I don't know if I believe that or not. Um, if it's true, then it's just above my pay grade. It's just something I don't understand. Um, so I, it, but if it is true, it would make sense of why I'm so loyal to my father. You know, it, it's it's not just him raising me and being his son, and, and you know, there there may be some truth in the adoption aspect of it. Um, I, I do know that when kids are born, it's very important for the child to bond with the mother. Um, and you see that with, um, you see that when, when dogs, when puppies or kittens are taken away from the mom very early before they're supposed to, they, they, they tend to have like issues with um, being alone. So, uh, so, but he's always been important to me. Um, And, and I probably take things, when it comes to my father, I probably take things a little bit too personally sometimes. I may not show it, but, but uh, especially like after the trial and then with the divorce. Um, and it's gotten a hell of a lot better as I've gotten older. I'm not ready to rip somebody's fucking head off. Like if we, if the, I, was, uh, I was saying today, you know, if that incident at the gas station happened like when I was 20 years old, I, I, that guy would be doused in gasoline and lit on fire. You know what I mean? That, that's no joke. So, so I, I, I've kind of mellowed out over the years, but my, my relationship with my father has probably always been the most important one, even, even when we weren't talking to each other for a couple of years or going through our trials and tribulations as a, as a father and son, I think all fathers and, and sons. That, that they go through that period but uh, um, so he's really he's probably one of five yeah for one of four or five people that um, that I have probably ever listened to in my life and who have probably influenced my life throughout my whole life. Um, so I would say it was like my dad, my mom, my stepdad, and then my uh, best friend's father and, and my best friend's family. Um, they, they, they've all kind of given me advice or said things to me that, you know, that I still carry with me today that are important. Were those the four that were with you, supported you when, after your dad died? Were those the four people that you reached out no, to? Or did no, you shut when, down? when my dad died, I was not on good terms with my sister. I was not on good terms with my mother or the rest of my family. Um, I don't even know if we were talk, speaking at that time. Um, I think I was just nice to my sister because I had to be because it was my dad's funeral. Um, and then uh, my friend Andrew and his family, they were, they're all on the East Coast. And then Andrew's dad, um, he was sick with cancer. And then a month, almost to the day, a month later after my dad died, his dad died. Um, so, uh, so I pretty much went through that shit by myself. Me, Jack, Jack Daniels, and Budweiser, for the next decade and a half is what got me through, you know, losing my father, that and working all the time. Did you have uh, somebody like you have now, Abel? Did you have a puppy or a dog no. at the time? No. no. That would have helped? Probably. Because that probably, probably would have curbed my drinking a little bit. I would have gotten arrested. Probably wouldn't have gotten a DUI. But, but you know, I can't go back and change any of that shit. So, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I was raised like you do what you got to do to, you know, you get fired, you go out and get another job as soon as you can. You know, my dad died. I think I was back at work two days later, um, working 10 or 12 hour days. And then when I got home, I'd fucking drink myself to sleep and wake up at five the next morning and do it all over again. And, you know, and I was drinking pretty heavy back then. And that's just how I coped with it. And, and, uh, you know, 
Well, I'm pretty. I can fuck tell you that. In hindsight, <laughs> in hindsight, knowing what you know now, you know people that I've known had similar situations, and they missed out a portion of their life. Things they either could have done, should have, would have, right? But knowing what you know now, the questions that you have, the things you want to learn, the experiences you want to be able to continue to have, the questions you've always wanted to ask your father, you never did. Would you, have, would you feel that if you didn't hit the bottle at the time, that your life would have been different? I don't know. Um, I, 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 yeah, maybe, because if I didn't get that first DUI in 2006, I would have still had my license, and I, I probably would have moved away from Ohio. So, and you went to Ohio because of what? You told me. I want the audience to know it was work and a woman. It was work and then a woman, or a woman and then work. Well, it's a combination of both. It usually is. So I wouldn't have. It it was mostly because of her, but I wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't have moved to Cincinnati had I not secured a job first. So so that's why I say a, a, a woman and work. But I you know I don't know. I mean I you know I can't. I, I would like to think that if I never got that DUI in 2006, that I would have moved. But I can't say that, that, that for sure. So for me to say that like, I'm missing out on anything, I don't know. Maybe, you know. maybe people have to go through 10 or 15 years of shit to get to like, the place that I'm at now where I'm like, ready to go, I'm ready to start a new chapter, I'm ready to do new things in my life. Ready to live the dream. I don't know if fucking sitting on a horse and watching some guy's sheep in a field in Montana is really a dream, but I'll fucking do it for 10 bucks. <laughs> Zach's got a good perspective on life. I appreciate you sharing everything. Just, I just want quiet, peace and quiet. Yeah, I'm there with you. Um, I don't know how we're looking on time. I think you guys may have a lot of questions. What time is it now? Yeah, we're actually running a little low on time. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're probably going to have to save the questions for the next session. Um, but if there's uh, something, you know, somebody wants to bring up uh, real quick, if somebody either has a question or if, uh, or if you want to wrap things up or if Zach wants to wrap things up, that's... No, we'll take, I think maybe... Whatever you guys want to do is fine with me. And especially if you're not going to be here tomorrow, this is your chance. I don't know why you'd want to miss it, but... We'll take a question. Yeah. Um, Anthony? More of a comment. Thank you for coming back. Yeah. It's great to see you. I know we had some chat before. Um, on behalf of probably some of the new people that are here, too, you said something at the last show um, after Frank and John Bill were in, and you said, after you met the community, you said, I got a lot to take back with me to think about. So for kind of the new people that might be here this time around, you want to talk about what that, what that meant? Yeah, so just real quick for some of you who weren't here last time, I really didn't know what the hell I was walking into yeah. when I came up here. I, re I really didn't. And um, I was actually really surprised at what I found when I came up here. Um, so when I got home, like I've never really wanted to own one of the cars. So I came up with a crazy idea that I'm still working on and I've been, been mulling it over, but I came up with this idea and it involved the car. Um, and I think you guys have kind of changed my opinion on that. Um, my opinion was definitely changed by meeting a lot of the people here. Like in Myth and Mogul, I, I didn't really understand how to answer what legacy was. And then I think I was asked that, all right, I made a comment about legacy, kind of dumping it on your shoulders, not, not like in a bad way, I wasn't trying to do that. Um, so when I got home, it, it really forced me to like, to look internally, like what the hell is my problem? You know, you know why, 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 why did I avoid this for so long? Um, and, like I'm not as uncomfortable with the car now. I was very, very, very uncomfortable with the car for the bulk of my life. Um, and very apprehensive about meeting people and discussing the car and the legacy and everything else like that. Um, 
so what I found was just a, a, a group of uh, a bunch of hardworking people, a bunch of hardworking Americans that love the car and they treat the car really well. Um, everybody loves my dad. I was kind of surprised about that a little bit, you know, in a way. I mean, I didn't think anybody hated his fucking guts, but like, I just didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand, you know, I just didn't understand the community. Um, you know, and so, uh, it, I, it, like, my heart is a lot warmer towards every, all, all aspects of, of the group, of the car, of the history, of everything. And th it, I don't think that would have happened had I not come up here in, in 21. Um, and so when Rich, Rich threw it by me and then we, you know, I was like, yeah, man, I'll come back up, you know. I, I, didn't, I didn't know still really what I was walking into, but, you know, I, I, I was kind of hoping to see some of the faces that I met last time, you know, some of you guys. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, DeLorean, Ohio, man, I met the, met the owners of, you know, the shop, man, and they're just awesome people. You know, she was so nice to me, Mike was nice to me, and it's not because I'm John's son, I just think they're that kind of, people you know I mean Jesus Christ how many people they have there and they cooked all that food for everybody I mean that's pretty fucking cool I wouldn't do that you know it's like pretty BYOB man you know so um, you know you guys really like you guys are just good people just good hearted American people that work hard that love the car that love love my father love the legacy and that's why I took the, you know, I was like, I have to come up here and deal with the issues that I initially first talked about. Because I, I think that you guys, you know, somebody from my family should probably say something about it to you and to the community and, and represent. Um, and, uh, and, you know, let you know that I'm not necessarily on board with everything everybody else fucking might be, but I'm not, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I feel a, a sense of responsibility to, to the car, to you guys, and to my father to, to do what I can to come up and answer questions and meet people and be open and honest about, you know, how I view things and what I see and what I've been through, what I think my father went through, you know. Um, so that's kind of like over the last two years of, of kind of how I ended up back up here as well. So, you know, I'm glad to be up here and, and, and seeing all you guys and meet new people and new faces, so. Well, Zach, you're, uh, you're an unbelievably great ambassador for your father and your father's name. Um, exceptional. Um, when I first got into the DeLorean community, uh, Rich was one of the people who said, we must continue the DeLorean, carry the marquee. It was important to carry the marquee forward. You and your sister in different capacities want us to maintain a DeLorean legacy. And if it's up to us, it will continue. So it's things like this that we do, and we appreciate you taking the time today. We're gonna do this again tomorrow, and we'll probably open it up for more questions next time. Yeah, Thank tomorrow you. I'll, I'll uh, you, you know, we'll just open it up for questions, and I'll, I'll be happy to, anything you guys wanna talk about, I'll, uh, if you wanna talk about fucking rainbows and puppies, I'll talk to you about <laughs> rainbows and puppies. Well, we will be talking about Abel so, tomorrow, too. So. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Zach and Tom. Okay, our next presentation, the final presentation for this afternoon, is uh, um, a few more stories and a uh, short interview with Zach DeLorean. Uh, we want to remind everybody that there is no uh, recording or videoing other than the authorized video for the event. So we will distribute the, the uh, videos through DeLorean Tech later this summer or this fall, depending on how much time they take to edit down. So um, please uh, follow, follow those directions as much as you possibly can, or you may be asked to exit the building. Um, so without further ado, uh, Tom Sedor from the DeLorean Midwest Connection and Zach DeLorean. Well, hey everybody. Um, for those that were not here yesterday, you missed a good one if you did miss it. But uh, we're going to try to 
be here on round two of what I call The Adventures with Zack DeLorean. Well, you, if you did miss it, there was quite a bit of heavy stuff going on. And with that in mind, um, I know there are going to be a lot of things, a lot of ramblings going on in the DeLorean community, but that's a good thing. We want to keep things rolling, and there's a lot of things to talk about. This is not a normal DCS. This DCS is DCS Lite. It used to be a much bigger event. So because it's DCS Lite, maybe we're going like to maybe tone it down a little bit, just a little bit. But nonetheless, um, I want to make sure that today we get a chance to get questions and answers from the audience. Yesterday, we kind of, both of us kind of went a little overboard, which is what's wrong with that. It's just that we took a little bit of time. <clears throat> so we'll try to get questions and answers going. And kind of what I said yesterday, Zach, is people are kind of learning a little bit about you. I'm really digging it. Um, there are probably more things we want to get to know about you. So this is your opportunity, once again, stage to not only kind of explain a little bit about yourself, but your family, too. You know, so hopefully you'll get a chance to talk about your mom, your dad, and really your childhood. You know, we, I mentioned this yesterday, really didn't get totally into it, but, you know, what are the ideas of, you know, what gets you up in the morning? What, what makes your clock tick? You know, we want to continue that. So, I think a good question to start off with is uh, Framing John DeLorean. How many of you in this audience have seen Framing John DeLorean? Pretty riveting. Uh -huh. <laughs> Pretty riveting. scary, actually. So, you know what may be scary, maybe it tell us a little more. So, my understanding is that when Tamir shot it, he shot it on his home video camera, which is not good enough in quality. So, we had, they had to reshoot. And when then they reshot, there were multiple days of recording. So there are things that we don't know about that I'm thinking this may be a good time. If you've got some recollection of a couple, one, two, or three stories, maybe you could share with them with us right now. Um, so when Tamir, he, they came to uh, Cincinnati to, to interview me, it was but I believe it was about 12, 13, maybe 14 hours total in two days that uh, they were asking questions and interviewing me. Um, the first day was about 10 hours of that um, in a hotel room. And now, if you were here yesterday, yesterday was kind of a, kind of a, set the record straight from my point, kind of, bitch session, if you will, um, and uh, uh, trying to give just some, some insight back to, to this community on, on uh, just kind of how I felt about everything. So when they interviewed me, it was just question after question after question, and that's kind of what that interview was. So what you see in the documentary is um, just bits and pieces of obviously editing, so they had to edit some, some of the answer out and just use bits and pieces of it, which was fine because I knew that was gonna happen. That happens in any any movie, whether it's a, a Tom Cruise movie or you know, Framing John DeLorean, there's just gonna be tons of editing. So a lot of what I really was, um, uh, up until that interview, nobody, nobody really ever ask me my opinions or my views on anything and um, mostly that's because I was pretty quiet and I, I never really put myself out there to to answer questions and I, did, I did, never went to any of these events um, a lot of documentaries were trying to get done I think Tamir had me under contract two or three different times where the contract that I would sign like I couldn't I couldn't interview for another documentary like it, it was only for them and uh, we went through, I think, two or three stages of that. So by the time he finally got it, it was about 40 years of shit building up that, that just stuffed down as far down as I could possibly stuff it and, and, you know, and, and just try and keep living my life. My parents always told me to go out and live your life and everything else will figure itself out. So, um, Somehow we got on the, and I can't remember exact questions, but I'll give you an example, is somehow we were talking about the FBI and the agents involved. And my question, 
my one of the questions that I always had, which was part of my answer, giving answering their question was, I would like somebody to personally explain to me how you can you can alter documents, present them in court as evidence, and nothing happens to you. If if I lie in court, and not even present documents, if I lie in court and I get caught, I'm probably spending six months in jail. And this is a federal court. There's no plea bargaining. The federal government doesn't plea bargain crap unless you're, unless you're Hunter Biden. You know, I mean, everybody else, that poor horned bastard who was running around in the Capitol, they jailed his ass for two years without a trial. So how is it the FBI can change dates on documents, hand them to the prosecutor, and I'm sorry, but I think the prosecutor know, knew, and I think he walked in, into court, presented the evidence. Fortunately, my father had a good lawyer, and they brought all that, I think they brought it all out of court. And how the hell they, those agents still have badges? Why are they still working for the federal government? It's bullshit. I lie on the job. I get fired. I've been fired from jobs just for telling my boss to go fuck himself. <laughs> so, and that's true. So, you know, and then how does the prosecutor become a federal judge in the state of California years later? Because they interviewed one of the, they interviewed one of the, the agents and then the prosecutor they interviewed, they showed the title, and he was like a federal judge. How, in what universe, somebody explain to me, in what universe does that, is that allowed? So there was like, there was just a ton of that stuff in the interview. And um, um, so that's just kind of a small portion that I can remember that we talked about, you know, and, and you know, and you know, I brought up things about my father that I've heard from people over the years, and some of it's been good and some of it's been bad. You know, um, the line where I, the line in the movie where I say, uh, you know, what would you be willing to do to save your life's dream? Well, that was told to me by a friend of mine when we were probably 18 years old. We were sitting out in a field on Lamington Farm, my dad's farm, in a pickup truck, smoking a joint and drinking some beers. And we, we were, somehow we got on the subject of my dad and the trial and all that other stuff. And I'm not sure exactly what I said. Um, I, and he, my friend turned to me and he goes, well, man, he's like, think about it. How, what would you be willing to do to save your life's dream? The whole life is built up to this one moment, what would you do if you had to protect that? And so I've carried that with me all the way up until the interview. And that's how that line ended up in the movie, and that's where that came from. So for you know, 30 or 40 years, these are the things that I'm always processing, I'm always fighting to, to try and understand. I'm trying to understand how a prosecutor who lies in court with falsified documents becomes a fucking federal judge. I, I just don't understand it. I think it's bullshit in this country. I love my country. I love the Constitution, Declaration of Independence. But I'm sorry, man, that, you know, like nobody got held accountable and we got fucked. Explain that to me. Somebody explain it to me like I'm a fucking four-year-old studying history in kindergarten because I don't get it. And... So when I look around and I see what's going on in our country today, it just, it absolutely, completely pisses me off. And, 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 and I'm not talking about people who are Democrats that go to work or people who are Republicans go to work. It's, it's like they treat us like we're fucking stupid. And that's, that's the part that I don't like. You know, if you're going to take everything away from me, you know, at least give me an A-plus for showing up and turning 51 and not putting a handgun in my mouth. 50 year or one years old and, and you know I'm still standing here <clears throat> today you know I haven't put a handgun in my mouth yet Dude, wait a minute. You, and, I, and I don't plan on doing it. Do 
did you, did you ever have that thought? No. Good. Good to hear. No, I mean, but but then that goes back to who my parents are, right? Um, you know, I, you, and I think in the interview, no, that was at his funeral. I said something. I, I briefly spoke at his funeral. You know, and I have never ever seen a man personally in my life take a beating like my father did and get back up and keep fighting. So. And I'm not trying to minimize, you know, I'm not trying to make, minimize people who are suicidal, who have mental health issues. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, the way I was raised and what I've seen and what I've been through in my life, you know, failure's going to happen. You're going to lose stuff. Life isn't fair. You might not get justice in this world. But you got to get up in the morning, you have to put on your boots, you got to go sell tacos or do construction or tree work or whatever it is you got to do to keep a roof over your head and dog food in your dog's bowl. And that's how I was raised. So when like people out there getting welfare checks and shit who can go to fucking work, like, fuck you, man. You know, I'm out there busting my ass. You can. Sorry, I'm getting into it's... politics and social issues, but, but it, to me, it's all related. You know, accountability, right? Yeah. Accountability, you know, being brought up in a family, that hard work and dedication to your family and, and just an appreciation for what you have and working hard for what you got. That's that's a respect that uh, your family has passed down to you. And that's a character that you know, we really love. Um, yeah, you, 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 you know, you don't quit. You know, my father never quit. He never, ever quit. Until his last dying day. Yeah. I mean, in the documentary, you know, they show him eating breakfast in that god-awful pink shirt, you know, looking at the next DeLorean, which was the DMC2, which is the name that he was going to give it, or the name of the next company, you know, you know, always working on something, a golf club, or, you know, some patent, or some tire, or some tire design, or engine, or whatever, and so, you, you know, he just never stopped. You know, talking about what you said about the last scene in the uh, documentary, Tamir's documentary, did they orchestrate the end of that documentary based on what you said? Or was that predetermined and you just happened to talk over that? Because it was a perfect setup. Him in the room, picture in the corner, cross behind him. Well, I, 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 I can't remember how Tamir phrased it the last time I was up here, but... Um, what I do know, from what I understand, what was told to me was Sally had made him breakfast, and then she left the room. And when she came back, he was like hunched over, or some something like that. So I think he was sitting on the sofa eating breakfast, not at a table. So there's a lot of artistic license that they take, but you know. And then uh, they took him to the hospital and. Day later, he was dead. So. One of the things uh, you, that was brought up in, is that he was born again. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and you brought it up to me when we were driving up from Cincinnati, was that he was born again. But when you were a child, you have recollections of your father helping other families out through the church. So when people just say he went to, during that whole stage that he found God later on in his life, it's not just at the end. He had a will and a direction spiritually earlier, correct? Well, when we lived in New York, I remember going to uh, St. Patrick's Church with him, but it wasn't like, wasn't anything that I remember we did on a weekly basis. There was something about, you told me once about at a church he was giving gifts on Christmas to a family? No, point. that was when we went out to Colorado. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But he, like, so, like, when he got arrested last time I was up here, I was like, yeah, man, you know, if I got caught in a room with a bunch of cocaine, you know, got in a jail cell, I'd find Christ pretty damn fast, too. So, you know, but I think after, after you know, kind of through the trial and after the trial, um, like, he was baptized on the farm in between his arrest and the, and the trial. But, you know, throughout his life after the the, the initial arrest. I mean, you know, he was going to church once a week. He was always reading his Bible. So I don't think it was like, you know, I don't think he was faking it, you know, 
for the next 20 years of his life. I mean, I just don't believe that. I think he was, I think he, he really came to find God and, <laughs> and believed in, in God and, you know, uh, you know, became religious, whatever you, however you want to phrase it. So, Let's get to hear. There's a lot of positivity. You talk about documentary, how it's affected your life. There's one thing you said, and <clears throat> it was instrumental. Tamir has had a major impact on your life. Yeah, the documentary I, I, I never had these problems until him and my sister got together and introduced me to him. So, <laughs> well, you weren't talking to him for all the problems I've had for the last 20 years. Let's Minus see. the drinking. The drinking is my fault. Gotcha there. But there was one thing you, you mentioned that you didn't talk to your sister or your mom for a while. Right. And doing a documentary or going through that process and afterwards, it helped build, reopen up your relationship with your family. Correct. So that was positive, correct? Correct. Yeah, we, uh, my mom and I uh, really hadn't talked in probably close to a decade. And then when I saw the documentary, uh, so, uh, you know, when you go, when you, when you, when you live your life, based on information you're getting from outside people and a lot of outside people telling you different stories about your father and you know and then your dad's telling you this about this person or you know you know you you, you start blaming the wrong people or you I, I don't really quite know how to explain it to you guys but so it, it, it drove a huge wedge between me and my mother um, for a very, very, very long time. A lot through the 90s and then a lot through probably almost all the way up until the documentary came out, which was 2019. So, you know, damn near 20 years, um, a big chunk of it, we, we never talked. And then when we did, we'd always be arguing. Um, and so when the documentary came out and I saw it, I called her and I was like, I had no fucking idea. Like, like I had no, I had no understanding of what my mother went through. And um, because I, I think I had pushed everything down so far and so deep in my life that that I wasn't necessarily trying to be selfish. It was like I just didn't open my eyes to to see how it affected other people. So we were sitting talking last night. Uh, me and the Pogs and a few of the other guys out here and uh, you know I, I until I started coming to these events and then I started looking stuff up on YouTube documentaries about the DeLorean company and my dad and, and all this other stuff um, I, you for, I, it never dawned on me that there was like 3,000 other people whose life it affected when he got busted and then the car company shut down. And it's not because I'm arrogant, I just, it's just never, I don't know why it didn't occur to me, why, why that didn't happen. And it, it was, when you guys were talking last night, and you're, you know, it's one of the best jobs we ever had and I loved it. You know, John's the reason I left General Motors or Pontiac or whatever and, and things like that and went with him. And then you said you wouldn't even change it if you could go back. And it kind of hit me. I was like, holy shit, man, that dude lost his job when, when the company went down. And so, so I, you know, I never processed that. I never processed, like, what my mother went through, you know. Um, you know, I think, I think the way I looked at it was, that, like, it just, like, it affected, like, the four of us. Like, the, like what I considered my immediate family, my father, my mother, my sister, and myself. And I never really like took the time to like think things through, like guys do. We don't really think shit through all the time. So, well, the thing is, is you do have a relationship with your mom now, and that's pretty phenomenal. How is she doing? She's good. She's doing real well. We talk maybe. I try and talk to her twice a month. Um, I think the last time I talked to her was the beginning of July. So I do have to call her when I get home. But, uh, but we we try. And, we try and communicate, you know, I get busy, she gets busy, life goes on, and, you know, we eventually catch up a little bit. When uh, you were younger, you had talked about, we talked yesterday about going to overseas to see the manufacturing plant with your dad. So the question came up in my head, our head was, 
Did you get a chance to ever go out with your mom to any of her modeling gigs? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Yeah, so my mom, uh, well, I actually had a really nice big, I don't know, it wasn't an 8x10, it, it was a picture about, about like that, and it was a black and white, and we were out um, at a shoot for her, and it was me, and my mom, and my sister, and we were sitting on the beach, I think it was out in Long Island. And uh, of course, my dog. I uh, uh, forgot to create him one day, and I came home, and he got in my closet, and uh, he got a hold of one of my photo albums. And then uh, that picture is too big, and I didn't, I hadn't gotten it framed yet, and uh, so it was kind of rolled up. And I came home, and there, like, there was shit everywhere. <laughs> I mean, everywhere. Like, you know, if the floor of my apartment was this big, like the stage, this whole entire thing was covered. It was covered like, I think he got a hold of a pillow, he got a hold of books, um, anything he could get his hands on. And, uh, and the picture was one of them. So, um, and then my mom also did, while she was modeling, before 1984, after 1984, she just did a lot of talk show stuff in LA. But before that, she was on like Love Boat, uh, Matt Houston, uh, Fantasy Island. She had done a few movies as a teenager. Um, so, I, like, I she brought me on the set to um, Love Boat. So you get to meet some of the actors and stuff like that. So there was some stuff like that I would do with her. Um, sometimes go down to the, the photos, the, the studio, maybe where, where she was shooting and things like that. Did she bring her on your show at all, like working the backstage? Yeah, and then you, you, and I never, I always was real uncomfortable, but of course you'd be like, oh, there's my son, and then the camera's on you, and then you gotta go sign a release form, and we've gotta find footage of that. And then they, they <laughs> take blood from you, and all kinds of <laughs> shit, so you can't sue them ever. Uh, Did you ever run into any really cool uh, people, in actors or actresses or popular figures on the show or on the background? No, I mean, I, I met, um, I forget how I got there. Uh, my friend, my mom was friends with an agent and uh, they were over and he took me over. I think this was before Bruce Willis got real big, but he was doing like a secret commercial. So I met Bruce Willis on the, on the commercial set. Um, who else? I mean, I'm sure I've met quite a few people. You know, my dad was really good friends with Roger Penske, so I, I, I kind of knew him, which to me is cool as shit, because I've always, no matter what happens between my dad and Roger, like, I just, I love watching all his teams race and win and dominate for like a decade. Like the Marlboro racing team in the 80s, I mean, my dad was, they were not good friends. And so we'd be watching the race and I'm like, kill Roger, kill Roger. My dad's sitting right there, you know, but, um, you know, and I've, I've, I've met a few actors here and there when I lived in LA because my mom was in, in the entertainment business and my stepfather, he was, um, you know, he worked at ABC, and then he went on to United Artists, and then um, yeah, I lost track. I, I had moved away, and then I lost track. You mentioned your dad. Um, I was going to ask the question about when you were younger, what kind of sports you used to watch. Um, you just mentioned that you used to watch racing together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, auto racing was a big one. Um, motocross was a real big one. Um, not so much. No, we never really watched any off-road racing because back then, um, in the 80s and 90s, you didn't have like access to all the channels we have now. And uh, so, but he knew Mickey Thompson and uh, was good friends with him and Mickey Thompson. Uh, Tom, Mickey Thompson off-road tires. That's Mickey Thompson, and he was big into racing and auto racing. And, and my father had said that he kind of came up with the idea of, so back in the day, motocross was always outdoors. It was always like some farm field somewhere. So it was an, always an outdoor 
course, and it was you know, a huge circuit around the U.S. Well, I think the way my father described it was Mickey came up with the idea of stadium racing, so like in, like indoor motocross tracks, uh, and then uh, see. and then he raced. He did a lot of off-road, desert racing, motorcycles, trucks. You know, one thing. I was thinking about it the other day when we were talking, but the, I had an my dad gave, my dad offered to get me hooked up with Mickey so that Mickey would take me out in one of his off-road trucks, and I never took him up on it. And, uh, well, the way my father described desert racing was, yeah, they're going 120 miles an hour over boulders. Well, I'm, like, thinking what a boulder is, and I'm like, that... Well, it doesn't really make sense, and that's got to be scary as shit. Well, then as I started watching more desert racing, you know, you're like the areas that those are in, you're going 30 miles an hour. When you when you hit open stretches of desert, you're hitting 130. You know, so so in my mind, it's like I'm not getting into the truck with some fuck. Yeah, I don't know this guy, you know, and and so even to this day, I I. I uh, uh, I really recruit that's one one thing my father told me or offered to do go do and I didn't take him up on it and I, re I regret it to this day maybe you and I can convince Rich to get his uh, monster D out and we can go off-roading on the dunes or something like that I think that'd do 130 man I'm sorry man I, I, Rich I want to get I want to drive and I want to go in it but like like I think the the big trophy Baja trucks, man, the, the beasts yeah. of the desert, man. Like, they would make a great commuting vehicle. <laughs> Straight down, nine, you know, where you got the the grassy median, everybody's stuck, and you're just blowing by and doing 130. Like, yeah, I'm going to work, man, sucking on some coffee. But, but that's the, in with that kind of racing, and that's the stuff that my dad and I would watch. We'd watch, like, NBA basketball games, but that's only if Jordan was playing. Yeah. You know, um, I'd come in, he'd be watching golf, and I, I just couldn't fucking watch golf. Man. It's just like watching <laughs> eight guys. Um, and then we watched, like, uh, when they had it on, we would watch, uh, uh, like, MotoGP bikes, like uh, Kevin Schwantz, uh, Lawson, just all the big American names just go over in Europe back in the 80s because nobody had ever seen these guys. Like, they're, they're riding style. They just dominated forever. They, did, they, did, they all weren't on the same team, but uh, I really love, like, GP racing where bikes are doing, like, 200 miles. I think they're getting up over 200. They're getting, bikes today are getting up around 210 miles an hour on a track. That's insane. I don't think that uh, it, takes a, it takes a little bit of a different person to do that. You were into it, but you're out of it. No, not, not like that. I mean, I like to watch it. You talk about watching TV and things you used to watch. So, not as much anymore, but when we were all kids, you guys remember Saturday morning cartoons? Right? Yeah. So, just tell me a little bit about when you'd wake up on a Saturday morning. Did you wake up and watch cartoons with your sister? Did you watch TV with your with your mom and dad? How did that go in the morning? You wake up to like, were you cuckoo for, for Cocoa Puffs? It, did you like make it breakfast? depends on where we were. So if we were in New York City, I'd watch uh, cartoons, you know, maybe in the morning on Saturday or Sunday with my dad. Um, but when, if we were in Palm Valley, it was like, I got a, I think I, yeah, my mom made me eat breakfast, but then I was out riding all day. And then like when we were, when he, when he fought Lammy to the farm, then again, it was like on the weekends, like you, you just couldn't get me off the bike. Like rain, snow, whatever. I was always out with my friends riding. We were never. That was the only time my mother ever. But actually, my, when it would rain and there was thunder, my mom told like told me I could not go outside and ride my bike. So, you know, it's it's a lot different than kids today. Kids today are just playing games and stuff. So you weren't like a, a battleship or Merlin kind of guy, you know, or playing Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys. You were a guy getting out there and getting dirty out in the field. Yeah, you know, walking with the dogs in the woods, you know, just fucking around in the woods, doing stuff we probably weren't supposed to be doing, you know, like making mini fires. I mean, I'm surprised we didn't burn like 600 acres down. But um, so we were, I, once we could, once I could get out of the city and, you know, do stuff, I was never, 
I was never really in the house at all. So when you guys used to go on vacation, where'd you guys go aside from the estates? Um, we would fly to, before my dad had bought Lamington Farm, we, on, the, on the major holidays, we usually went out to um, California to, and stay with my mom's family for a little bit, and then we would go down to Palma Valley for a week or two, and then we'd come back up, stay with my grandparents, and then go back east. But then when, when he bought Lamington Farm, all, most of the holidays, and just about every single weekend, we'd always go out to New Jersey for so. so we'll kind of try to wrangle things up because I want to do more q and I'm going to only have a couple more questions. But one of the things that, uh, or two questions I'm going to have for you. So I don't know if you, if you actively think about it, but you said that your dad has affected you as your, after his death seems like in a very positive fashion. It's got your head spin spinning, but at the same time, you've got some kind of guidance. But there's something that I think, I, you probably do or don't think about it, but you know, he helps to raise millions of dollars every year after his death. And that's done sometimes through the Michael J. Fox Foundation. The Hollers are heavily involved with that. They put 800,000 miles on their DeLorean. They go from city to city. Are the Olivers here in this room right now? But, so what I'm saying is that, you know, the legacy of your dad is one thing. The impact he's had, you could say definitively, like the Musk, the early Musk, but the reality is, is that still people are gonna be helped by your dad because what they do, partially what I do too, is raising funds for the Michael J. Fox Foundation through Team Fox. So it's something to be proud of, and I know that you don't maybe actively think about it, but that's impacting people in a major, in a major way. So I just want you to kind of think about that. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't want you to comment if you don't want to, but I wanted to comment on it because I think it's a pretty big part, and it's very impactful. I mean, the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is over a billion dollars. It, it kind of goes to what we were kind of talking about a little bit last night was... Um, like I'm kind of like coming to this. So from from the interview for the documentary until today, because um, I don't can't speak about tomorrow. I don't know what the hell's going to happen tomorrow. Russia could nuke us tomorrow. So, uh, but you know what's what's it, what's interesting for me, and I think I think you asked me yesterday. I think you asked me what how it's impacted me um, is. Is like I'm getting my history back. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. I, in my head, it makes sense what I'm, I'm thinking, but I feel like I've had so much taken from me. And then when I come to these events and I, and I see some of the footage in the documentaries, like, like pieces of the puzzle are starting to kind of come together and, and fit together. And what I, what I, it was weird because almost, almost 20 years now, I think it would be 20 years, 2025 that, yeah, 20 years that my father will have passed. And then like right now the car's 40 years old and it has had a huge impact on society. I mean, not society at large, but it has had a huge impact on society. And I, I think I was saying to you guys was that, like, you know, he did, he, he accomplished what he set out to do, which was to help people. And, you know, whether, you know, so they, Terry and Oliver, buy the car, they dress it up, back to the future, they tour around, they raise money. You know, like he, he's had kind of a, an indirect impact on that. And, you know, and like I said to you, man, I think, I th I think that DMC was a big fuck you to General Motors and the entire auto industry. And my father's a very quiet guy, tall guy, skinny guy. It's just a, in his words, he was just a tall, skinny, white guy trying to make it in the world. And, um, you know, in, in, in that kind of like, 
the last couple of days has had a weird effect. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me that that somehow, some way, in some bizarre twist of fate in the universe that, you know, they they Terry and Oliver have raised a million dollars by driving one of my dad's cars around dressed up as a time machine, man. I mean it's like you can't make this stuff up. So, you know, and, and I think that's all he ever wanted to do. He all he ever wanted to do is build a safe, economical car that everybody around the world could drive and enjoy and have it look good and not be some piece of crap on the road. And he's done it. You know, they 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 try to fucking break him. They took everything he had. He was bankrupt. I think he may have had like fifty thousand dollars, maybe, sitting in a bank account. You know, and here it is, forty years later. It's it's still going. So you see, you have this, you got this puzzle going on in your head. It seems like, right? And let's say, let's say there's one more jigsaw piece puzzle to finish that puzzle. You just can't get it. But if we could take their, get some plutonium time machine and go back in time to ask your father one question that you didn't ask him. And one thing that you wanted to do with him, you never got a chance to do, what are those two things? What lawyer should I call when you die is probably what I would ask him. Legit. And, and actually doing, what would you want to do with your father? Um, I don't know, man, just probably have one last steak dinner. You know, uh, you know, the, you know, because that's what, that's, before I moved to Ohio, that's what we were doing. We'd have dinner once a week and catch up, and then uh, lunch once a week, and we just talk and, and you know catch up with each other, make sure each other's okay. But you know, the the one last question, I mean, that's kind of hard because of all the crap that's going on in the world right now, in society, and the economy, and you know, the national debt, and you know, men and women and gender and all this other crap is like, you know, I would really love to hear his opinion on worldly events. I mean, because he was into that. He, he believed in the civil rights movement. Um, you know, he, he started, uh, I think, I don't know, I don't know what the program was called, but it was for, 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 you know, people that work for GM who couldn't afford college, their kid could go through a program through GM scholarship, scholarship fund or something like that. And so, like, he actually gave a shit about people, you know, like, I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you know, he, he I think he was genuinely, genuinely, genuinely concerned for other human beings, not just themselves. I agree with that. So, at this time, I know yesterday we took a lot of time asking questions and we kind of went a little overboard with I yesterday, so I um, kind of want to start opening up to the audience, because I know you guys have a lot of questions, unless there's something else you want to say before I reach out. But I know you guys have a lot of them, so here's Zach. I wanted to maybe uh, recap one of the things on a little bit lighter note. One of the last stories we talked about at the, at the last uh, convention was um, uh, the story about uh, your dad and uh, getting a haircut. Um, yeah. If we could just kind of recap that one, kind of set the tone. So uh, um, I came home from Washington, D.C. I had fucking hair down here back when I actually could grow a full set of head of hair. I was riding a sport bike smoking a lot of weed, was totally confused with my life. And I came home and Roy Nesif arrived there about, I don't know, a couple of weeks after I got home. And, uh, but before he showed up, my dad's like, are you gonna get a haircut? And I'm like, no. And um, so Roy showed up and then my dad tried this for a couple of weeks and then Roy got there and he got Roy to bust my balls every single day about getting a haircut. I mean, these guys were like, in their 70s, you know, they're born in 1925, guys should not have long hair, so you, you can imagine the amount of abuse that I got from the, the yeah. two of them. And so every night at dinner and every day at breakfast for a couple weeks, they were just hounding me to cut my hair. So one night I got, I just went in the fridge, grabbed a bunch of beers, went upstairs, grabbed my dad's hair clippers, drank a bunch of beers and was like, fuck it, I'm teaching these guys a lesson, and I shaved my head. Oh, wow just all of it, and then I picked it. Came down in the morning, and I don't know if I was wearing a bandana or not, but they were both down in the kitchen, eating or getting coffee or whatever, and I walk in, I'm like, hey, what's up? And uh, they kind of looked at me, and I don't think they knew who the hell I was. Like, because <laughs> I look very different with long hair as opposed to short, and uh, 
um, they're like, what happened? And I'm like, what do you mean what happened? And, and they, they're like, your hair. And I was like, well, you know, you guys have been busting my balls for like three weeks about this, so I'm getting a haircut, so I just went ahead and did it, you know? And uh, um, the odd part of it was, was because at that point I had been working on, on the farm, so I was born in a ponytail. So my face was like tan from, from where the, the hair and the scalp meet back, but all this was tan, my neck was tan, and then there was like a white stripe from where my ponytail was. <laughs> It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a skunk or a fair or something, you know, running around there, shit, you know. And they, they thought it was funny as hell, but you know. So then over the years, I grew my hair back a bunch, and um, I think one of the last pictures I, that was ever taken of me and my dad was in New York, and I think I had long hair at the time. And uh, but then I think I hit like 35. It was like looking in the mirror and shit, so from there on out, I just shave my head once in a while. Yeah. All right, so we'll open it up to the uh, the audience. You guys have any questions? Rich has his mic over there. Just raise your hand, I'll pop up back. Just what you said there about Nesith, I was kind of surprised that those two maintained in contact for that long. Any idea what, uh, Maybe this is a strange way to put it, but what use was Roy to your dad at that point in his life? I I don't know. I mean, um, my dad was at that time still involved in lawsuits that stemmed all the way back, pretty much from '84 on. Because after after the L.A. trial, then there was the trials in Detroit for racketeering and embezzlement, like all this other stuff. Um, so like when Roy was in New Jersey, I think I, I had walked in the uh, dining room and there was all these uh, file folders sitting on the table and they're all labeled like from A to Z, A, B, C, D, E, O, G. And he was there organizing papers and I, I, like I saw it and I just kept walking through because at that point in my life, in my 20s, I was starting to I was starting to kind of start to put some pieces of the puzzle together that that my dad may not always be the same guy that I see drinking red wine and watching auto races with, you know. So, um, you know, not trying to throw my dad under the bus or anything, but I started to develop questions. And then Roy was always good to me. Like, he, he was always Uncle Roy, you know. And we always laughed and, and hung out and, you know, and I knew his kids and stuff. They'd come to Palm Valley and stuff for the weekend or whatever. But anytime I always felt like, if anytime Roy showed up, like, I may want to go on vacation for a couple of weeks because something might be possibly going on that I really do not want to be privy to. Um, you know, Roy, like, you know, in, in the documentary, they kind of hinted that my dad wrote this thing and Roy sent it to the, the GM and the papers and shit. And that's, I think that's the kind of work Roy did. But I also think like, if if you said no to Roy, you, you might get a broken arm. Kind of, I think it could go those kinds of ways. So with the court cases going on, I think my dad was always trying to get information out but he couldn't make it look like it was coming from him. Now that's just speculation on my part. So, but I know when Roy was there, that was the last time I ever saw Roy. So I know when he was there, it wasn't, it wasn't like a family visit, you know, hey, happy birthday kind of visit, you know. So, and, and, I, and what I learned with my father on, on that end of life was, is he never told me a lot of crap I never asked a lot of questions because if I ever had to give a deposition or I ever had to go to court and they asked me, do you know what your father's doing or do you know what Roy Nesseth is doing, I can, I can honestly say without perjuring myself, I have no idea what those two idiots are doing. You know what I mean? So, so there's, you know, I mean, that's, that's just, you know, that's just one small part of my life that 
you know, I just didn't ask a whole lot of questions about it. I always treated Roy with respect, not because he was a scary guy, but I've known him my whole life. Uh, what other type of typical dad things did your dad do? I know the one story you told last time was um, his obsession with getting rid of dandelions out of, yeah. the, out of the farm, and that was my dad too. I mean, they were just absolutely obsessed. He would be out there for hours picking those damn things, getting them out of the lawn. Yeah, I, I, he, well, he always, like, uh, when, we, when he first bought Lamington Farm, him and my mom would, like, go on long walks down the driveway. The driveway at Lamington Farm was nine-tenths of a mile long. So that's how far back it sat off the main road. Um, so they, you know, they would take the dogs and walk, you know, have dinner, we'd all eat, and then they'd go for their long walks. So I think he always liked to be outside. He liked nature. And um, so I think as he got older, uh, what I noticed was the walks got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So he turned to, like, mowing the lawn, you know, um, during the week, uh, the farm manager and I had control over the grass and the lawnmower on the weekends. He commandeered the tractor and the <laughs> lawnmower, so, you know. Um, so I think that was a way for him to get outside, like get out of the house, get out of the living room, and just kind of walk around and be outside, clear his head, and oh, there's a bee, you know, there's a bee, you know, so. Uh, but then in the winter time, you know, he didn't. He never went on walks. You know, he's always in the in the house by fire, reading or sketching or I don't know what the hell else he was doing. But he was always doing something inside. Remember, you said you told me that he was doing something in the yard. He had that pink shirt on. Uh, oh yeah. So, so the pink shirt you saw on the yeah, that pink shirt may have even been his. But the pink shirt Alex Alec Baldwin was wearing um, was the exact same shirt that my father always wear in the summer. So in the wintertime, he'd wear cowboy boots, jeans, and a denim shirt. And then in the summertime, he'd wear like topsiders, khakis, and this pink shirt. And so if you're wondering like where I get my personality from, it's mostly my father. And uh, my sense of humor is very much like his. So a buddy of mine came over and we were in, the, in my car, we were leaving, and my dad was out front picking meats. So he, my buddy's on the passenger side, and my dad's on that side of the car, so I rolled down the window. And I hope no, I hope no, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably gonna get in trouble on the <laughs> internet for this, but um, I, I rolled down the window, and he's like, uh, he, he's kind of looking at us, and I'm like, hey, man. He's like, what? And I was like, the gay parade called. They want their shirt back. <laughs> and he just looked at us, and then I just kept driving. And then, uh, um, and then sometimes the other one was, uh, I'd like to tell him, was uh, my buddy was with me one time again, and we roll up, and he's out there picking weeds, and uh, stop. And he's like, where are you guys going? I was like, well, the dry cleaners called. They told me your leather thong was ready, so I was gonna go down and pick it up. And, uh, you know, and then he'd give us one of these, you know, and, and uh, you know, so that's the, that, that my father was like that, or my favorite one he used to say to me, one time I was getting up, was leaving the living room, and my back was turned to him, and he goes, he goes, hey, and I turn around, and, and uh, he, he goes, I don't care what anybody says about you. I don't think you're an asshole. <laughs> so, this is this was the this was the kind of relationship my father and I had when we when as I got older in life. You know, when I was younger, it's a lot different. So, do you think that uh, Lee Pace had a better in Driven the movie as the actor? Did he do a better job than Alec Baldwin as present his personality? Do you think he was a kind of a blend of both? I never saw the movie. The only the only aspect of that movie I saw was like a two minute trailer on YouTube, where something with Hoffman in the car, the GTO, and that whole thing. And then the other one was like the other scene was like him and my mom were at some party, dancing, which is kind of unusual for my father because I've never known him to dance. And then. Um, uh, you know, he's on the phone with Johnny. Johnny's freaking out. I guess 
in the movie they're trying to portray that he got locked in the car and the car stopped or whatever on the highway and my dad's like you know don't worry about it whatever so i never saw the movie so i'm not really qualified to say much about it so. well for dcs 2025 we expect that answer <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the reason why I haven't watched it is because I, I, it would piss me off because I know Hoffman's kids were involved. Really? Yeah, that's, well, that's what I've heard. Okay. Of. Is Tamir going to do a second movie? I don't know. Did he tell you anything about that? No. But there's enough footage there. You said Ted it earlier. Uh, possible. I, I would imagine. You know, I don't know. Do you think that you could use live footage or are you going to put some new footage in there to really kind of stir well, things up? he's not interviewing me again. Like, because he's got all the shit he he's, he needs from me, man. I mean, if you can't get another five minutes out of me in 13 hours of video, I, then you better find a new fucking job because you ain't doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man, but I'm not doing that again. I've, 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 I've given a, quite a few interviews in documentaries and then some stuff outside. And, you know, I'm just kind of... You know, I'll come up here and talk to anybody about anything, but like I'm, I'm done with like documentaries and interviews because everything always just ends up fucking backfiring on me. So. Yeah, but it's a new you. It's a paradigm. It's it's, it's no, there is no what you see friend. right now has been like this for a very very long time. There's no new me. So, <laughs> so the adventures of Zach Delorean end here until next next DCS. Yeah. Unless people have other questions. Yes. I don't want to dwell on the lawn care thing, but. It was that one other story that you mentioned about your dad in a ladder. He was doing some tree trimming along the, the fence line. Oh, well, there's two, yeah, there's two, two ladder things. Um, the first one, this is back when, when we first moved on, well, when you first bought Lamington Farm. And when you go down the driveway, there's, there's, it's kind of lined with woods on both sides of the driveway. And so I guess like, you know, he liked to get out and be outdoors and he liked, you know, to like physical exercise and things like that. So he, he bought like a, a um, he was loaded a ladder and a pickup truck, took one of the chainsaws down and, you know, he's now he's down. And he's, you know, something happened to him. Like it'd be a while before somebody could find him or get to him because like, we just don't, don't travel up and down the driveway all that much. And so he was up in a, he was, he was pruning pine trees, like, it's green at the top and then everything, everything else is dead on the bottom and branches are stubbed out and stuff. So he wanted to clean up these pine trees as, as he was going down the driveway. I guess it bothered him when he was driving, I don't know. And uh, he took a ladder up and then uh, was using a chainsaw to cut these dead branches and stubs off. I guess he was like, I mean, I guess his feet were probably, you know, eight feet off the ground. So he's like eight foot up on this ladder. And I, I forget if he was like leaning out or something, but anyway, the, the ladder started coming off the tree while he's running a chainsaw eight feet off the ground. And chainsaws don't know the difference between wood and flesh. And I can attest to that, but, um, I almost lost a leg and, and a finger one time using chainsaws. But um, so yeah, so the ladder started coming off the tree, and he said he had to pitch the chainsaw, yep. you know, and, and he he landed, he was fine, he never got hurt. And then the other story, but that was back like probably eighty eighty one maybe, and then I think this was in ninety ninety seven or ninety nine. I had moved away for a year. I went back down to DC for a year. And when I came home, my father had a, had broken his arm. And when you're old like that, it takes a very, very long time for your bones to heal. And uh, when he bought the property, he, he got a permit to put in a helipad <laughs> on the property. And it was still grass. I mean, he, he never, he never put down like an actual landing pad, but you had to have a, a pole with a windsock on it. Well, the windsock over time, you know, just they get dilapidated and they get all frizzy like an old flag. So he takes the ladder, he went out and bought a new one, new flag, uh, wind flag, takes the ladder and you know, and I, I guess the thing has to be a certain height, so maybe the thing's like 15 feet off the ground where it screws in. 
And the, but the pole's only about that big. It doesn't have to be very big. So he, now he's up on this fucking ladder at like 77 years old, 76 years old, 75 years old, changing a windsock. Somehow he falls off the ladder and breaks his arm. I'm like, I'm like, dude, why don't you call me? I would have come over and done, you know? Like, so yeah, he, he, he's not very good with ladders. He's real good with cars, but he sucks with ladders. <laughs> well, he climbed up the gym ladder pretty quick, and um, that we're really proud of and everything he's done. Anybody have any questions? So, if we don't, you know, I'd like to thank a lot of people here. Oh, we do have a question. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, what it's like to be a, a young teenager when all this goes down. And uh, obviously all the, you know, kids can be awful, and I can't imagine that there was any, anything good that came out of, uh, you know, the, the trial that your dad was in. What, what was it like? Uh, school was pretty hard, you know. Well, one, because I sucked at school, so my grades always sucked. And then, and then, you know, dealing with divorce, because my parents, like, the ink wasn't even dry on the acquittal papers, and my mom's already divorcing my dad. So it was all boom, 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 boom. Then she got married. I had a, there was a, my stepdad moved into the house. Now there's a new guy in the house. So, so life for me for a very long time was kind of like it, just things were not getting better. Yeah. You know, great. My dad's not in jail, but you know the rest is is going down. Um, so kids can be cruel. You know, I, I, my mother was a whore, my father was a coke dealer, that kind of shit, you know, same stuff you guys probably get, but I had to deal with it at a much earlier age. Um, and, you know, that causes fights and things like that at school. But for me, there was like, there was just a lot of shame, I think. Uh, you know, like if you saw the car going down the road, I was like, you know, I was like hiding behind a tree. I mean, nobody knew who the hell I was, but, you know, but I knew who I was and I knew what that, that car represented, at least to me. And, um, uh, you know, so like, like, and, and that's kind of how I am today. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I have shame today because after yesterday, I hope that I resolved that issue for everybody. But, um, but back then, uh, and, and that's kind of why I don't really say my, when I introduce myself to people, I don't really say my last name. Um, um, and, and part of that too is like, I don't like when I'm out somewhere and I don't know the people I'm with, I don't really, I don't, I don't like to draw attention to myself. But when I was younger, there was a lot of, the, the name DeLorean was, there was a lot of, sh for me, there was a lot of shame, you know. Uh, so it made it, so life was pretty, like, life for me internally especially, like I, to my, maybe to my mom after a couple of years of me running around and have, making friends and things, like my life may have seemed better and that I was well adjusted, but inside was a fucking nightmare. I mean, I was in rehab by the time I was 17 with a cocaine and heroin addiction. So, um, you know, now obviously, you know, I've, taking care of all that and, and life for me is, is, is way, way, way much better. Like I'm not even, I don't even feel like I'm that person anymore. Um, but because it was so fresh that, you know, it's like, because, because the world shamed my father, you know, it was, you know, they, they, right out of the gate, man. And, and you see it today, they do it, they're doing it to Trump today. They're doing it to God knows who else today. Um, you know, they, they immediately go, before anybody has all the facts, they immediately throw the guy, the person under the bus, and it doesn't matter who it is. So, so then now there's 350 million people out there that think John DeLorean's a cocaine dealer smuggling a blow in the fucking exhaust pipes of DeLorean cars from Ireland and is working to overthrow the British government with the IRA. I mean, that's the fucking headline, you know? So then, you know, then people start making jokes, you know, and so now, now the DeLorean name is a punchline. Now, you know, so at, 
84, so right around 13 years old, like how do you process that? You know, how, to me it was a personal, you're attacking my father. You're not attacking John DeLorean, you're attacking my father. You know, it'd be like, you know, how would you feel if I attacked your father? Yeah, I'm not trying to throw this in your face, but you know, so for me it was like that personal thing. It wasn't like, it wasn't John DeLorean, Zach's dad, the automakers getting attacked. It was like, my dad, somebody is attacking my dad. So, so there's, there, was, there was a ton of shame for a long time, embarrassment. Um, now I got my name tattooed on my back, man. I mean, you know, you know, and with kids, if they talk shit, you know, I've, 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 I've gotten in fights, I've lost fights, I've, I've won fights. I mean, you know, the nice thing I learned about fighting is, is broken bones heal, you know? So I'll scrap with whoever, you know, I'll get my ass kicked, I don't care. <laughs> you know, my bones will heal, you know? So it, it, it was tough for a while. Do you, do you know how, like, you were what, five, like five years older than your sister? So did she feel that same shame at that time for you, in your in my, in your mind, or did you even know? Like, or did you even? Um, so my sister was born in '77. I was born in '71. So we're I think we're six years six apart. Years. If I do that math right. Um. So she would have been going. This. The September of '84, we were enrolled in like Cat, like Mary, Mary, Mary Mont Junior High School, or whatever it was. So we were going to a Catholic school in LA. So that it was like literally right after. So I think she was, she would be going into the like first, first or second grade or something. I was going into seventh grade, um, and with, I never really played a lot with my sister. I never really interacted a lot with my sister prior to, you know, because like between like 80 and 82, I was out riding motorcycles with my friends. I was in fifth grade, sixth grade. My sister was like in nursery school or kindergarten. Um, and so I, 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 I couldn't really process anything myself. Like I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, and my sister was so young, and I was trying to trying to figure out how to, you know. Now I'm living, now I'm living on a completely different coast in a completely different city with, and it, and, and my whole world had completely changed, you know. Um, so, so I, I I really wasn't really too concerned at that. You know, you're young, you're selfish, you know, and and I just didn't have the I didn't have the tools. <coughs> So I never, I never really paid attention to my sister very much. Even now, I don't pay too much attention. John. Hey, Zach. Um, yeah, man. So th thinking about kind of the, the backlash you're getting at school, different jokes and such. So just a couple years later, all of a sudden, this Hollywood blockbuster comes out, and the car is center stage again. Um, did, did the movie offer any any complexities with um, more jokes or did it become sort of uh, switched to some type of adulation or is it just getting a little bit older? I think you would have been what, um, 13, 14 when the movie came out in 85. So um, that's also got to be a complex age to, to have your name attached to the number one movie in America. Yeah. Um the movie was kind of weird because I, I saw it in the, in the movie theater. I think the first one is the, well, no, maybe I saw all three of the movie theaters, but when the first one came out, you know, that was just a year later after, after the trial was done. Um, so, and I don't know what, what the hell I was thinking because when they advertise everything in Hollywood, it's giant billboards and obviously the cars on the billboards, why the hell would I think, you know, the, so when they when they roll the car out of the trailer and the when you first see the car in the movie, I think it's they're in that parking lot and he rolls it off the trailer. And I was like, you know, I think I like ducked down or I was like cringing. I mean, nobody in the you know nobody in the movie theater knew sh who I was, and and I don't I, I think because it was still just so raw and fresh for me. 
but um, uh, so I was never really, you know, so every time it, the car itself, I, you know, I could enjoy the whole movie, but when the car popped on, in, you know, in a particular scene, it was always like, I was always like, it was like, it's like an old bird dog who's now gun shy, you know, and um, so I, the jokes, I think, start kind of fading. Uh, you know how when you're the new kid in school, everybody's testing the new kid? So once, once I started making friends in, in, the, in school, like people, you know, kind of see, I guess, who I was. So a lot of that stopped. And then, like, there was no, there was no real, you know, I've never actually heard, even to this day, like a bad Back to the Future joke. You know, so, or something like something negative and derogatory, you know. So, um, I mean, the, the movies themselves didn't really have much of an impact on me unless, unless it was something that I was doing to my, internalize it myself that made it have an impact on me. I think I'm explaining that right, but I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, we've got one more question, and then we're going to probably have to wrap it up. We're getting close to 5 o'clock, so Sounds good. we've got one question. Here we go. Hi. Yesterday, you unpacked quite a bit of information about your sister's activities. Sure. And my uh, follow-on question to that is, sure. do you see your life with your sister converging, or do you see the two of you diverging and going your separate ways? Uh, uh, my life is probably going to go in a very, very different direction. Absolutely. Um, if she starts a car, okay, I'm not, I don't want anything to do with it. Um, uh, she starts to school, that's great. I'll send her a hundred bucks once a year, make a donation, you know, whatever I can afford to, to support her in that way. But I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, after watching my father go through what he went through, um, getting the British government involved as a business partner. I've, if I do anything in my life that involves a business or a company or something, it's going to be my money. I don't want a partner. I'm not doing this crap. And I sure as hell am not getting into business with family. Um, I just, I just think that's just a recipe for disaster. Is it the way you always felt? Or was that something recently in the past couple of months? Or no, I've, I've, I've always felt that if I were to start a business, it's, 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 it's all me. So does your sister know that it's not personal against her? Or you're just saying anybody in the family can start a business? I mean, just trying to separate. I'm not, I'm trying, I'm not trying to play. I, 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 play, if, play, play, if, play, if, if a cousin came to me and said, I want you as a business partner, and saying that, that's not going to happen. Right. My point is, is I'm, I'm not trying to, to make you and Catherine get together and just go, meet again because a couple weeks ago is when shit went down but the, re the reality is is that it's not personal against her you're just saying in general if any family member did that's the way you'd feel about it so you're not personalizing it like you're not throwing it against her because she is no she is. but i you know like i'm 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 behind like my sister starting the school like i'm not behind her doing a car but if she does do the car and she wants me to come in and work for her that's not going to happen and i'm not going to invest anything in that and if you know I think the school's the right idea, right? The John DeLorean School of Engineering. A good Perfect. STEM school. Perfect. You know, just run with that. You know, that, you, because you're, you're educating people. You're giving people an education. You're giving them a work ethic and a job. And that's exactly what my father would want to do, right? But I, I, I don't want to invest money in it. I don't want to be a partner in it. I don't want to be a board member in it because one, my sister and I, on a good day, don't always get along. And um, before I came up here, I got an argument with her on the phone, and I guarantee you, my building is three stories, and I guarantee you, everybody in the building heard me have this little discussion with my sister. I just, it's, if, if she invited me to the opening, great, I'll go. But, you know, I'll donate money, but I, I my path, like, I did, my ideal job is sitting in a field watching on a horse in the middle of Montana in the winter watching some other guy's sheep form doesn't get eaten by bears and wolves for $10 an hour. I mean, that's, that's my ideal 
job, you know? Um, so, no, I mean, I love her. I don't know if I will ever, our paths will ever cross again like physically, maybe at one of these events and stuff, but I don't plan on going back east. Like, once I move west, I don't plan on going back east. You know, my dad's dead. The only reason I would go back to New Jersey is, is because he was alive. You know, I have friends there, but they're all married with kids, and I don't want to deal with that shit. So, so you, know, you know, so, you know, and I, I love her, and I wish her the best, man. And I, and I hope whatever venture she goes down, whatever road she goes down, I, I swear to God, man, I, I really do hope she succeeds at it. So, so we have Catherine to thank for having you here. Because tell us real quick, I know we're out of time, but this is kind of important, right? She was trying to get you here for years, because Catherine was here at two of our DCSs. So just tell us that. I mean, I'm sorry, I know we're out of time here, but this is kind of cool, kind of important. Well, yeah, I mean, the, you know, for years, she was trying to get me to go to it. Right. Tiberi even tried to get me to go right. to one. You know, then the minute I decided, okay, I'm, you know, I can come up, and now all of a sudden it's a fucking problem. Like, I'm disloyal to my father and my family. I'm like, hey. It, remember that line in the third Godfather where they where it's like, just when I get out, they drag me the fuck back in. I mean, it's like, Jesus Christ, you know, that's kind of how I feel with shit. You know, just when I'm, just when I'm, just when I'm making, you know, the, the, I'm in my boat and the fucking wind's at my back and we're going 50 knots down the fucking river. It's like, they're still like shooting cannonballs at me. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to try to pull you in for as much as we can. Um, yeah, honestly, you know, whatever. We love I, having you here. Well, you know, and I do want to say this. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me up here again. Um, this time is, is not that last time was a bad experience at all, but this time is a better experience. Um, and, you know, and, and I mean this sincerely is like, thank you for, for, you know, to all the speakers and, and, and the people here taking care of the cars and things like that. Thank you for like giving me some of my history back. That was, that was, fucking taken from me, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it means a lot, you know, I mean, I, I don't kiss ass, so, you know, I, I, you guys are all great, and, and you, you know, there's more cars here, and, and, it, and just the way you take care of them is just, you know, it's unreal, and 40 years later, my father, what he did 40 years ago, set out to do, he, he is fucking completed today. And I hope all the I hope these cars now we may all be dead and gone, but I do hope these cars are around for another hundred years. And GM is too, and I hope they're in the fucking toilet and those cars are still going down the road. Uh, <laughs> so it's up to us to keep the father's dream alive. We keep it alive by keeping the cars going. We keep it alive by going to car shows with our cars, get them out. And we keep it around and keep it going with DCS, whether it's DCS or DCS Lite. And a lot of that is, actually all of it is because of that gentleman right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, 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 Thanks. Thanks. Especially during this past week, it's been tough for you, Rich. And um, you know, your mom's here with us and God bless her soul. And um, you're very special in my heart, and a lot of people's here. I know people have known you for 20, 20 plus years, and we couldn't have a better DCS comrade, co comrade and colleague. You're the best ever. So, appreciate it, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here.